We're going to take a peek at the Lexus IS 350 convertible. Of course, right now it's a hard top. All you do is press a button on the dash, and in 20 seconds the hardtop disappears into the trunk, like so. If you have merchandise to carry in the trunk, you better do it with the top up, because with the top down and loaded in the trunk, you have just enough room for a set of golf clubs. Maybe. Gas mileage for the 3.5 is rated at 19 to 27 miles per gallon, which is what I've been getting. The smaller engine does 21 to 30. Actually, I've done 33 on the smaller engine in a previous vehicle. The quality of the interior is excellent with nice materials and workmanship. The glove box has plenty of room if you remove that monster sized owner's manual that's the size of a phone book. However, if you're sitting in the back, you might be a little cramped. These are mainly kitty seats. The IS350 has some good driving features. The steering is very quick and responsive. The brakes are very firm and responsive. And the handling is excellent. This is a nice sporty car. Engine power and pickup. Very good. I only had three gripes with this vehicle. One you can do something about, two you can't. Number one, don't order a convertible with black interior, folks. It attracts heat like a magnet. It's just not good, even with these air-conditioned seats. A nice tan color always works well, regardless of climate. Now, that's something you can do something about. Just don't order the black interior. The second gripe had to do with the sun visors. They fold down like all the others do, but they don't slide out. So you have this big gap in the door where all the sun comes in and bakes your face. I find this kind of odd because sliding sun visors are standard on even the cheapest of cars nowadays. But this seems to be a characteristic of Toyota Lexus products in general. They need to fix this. The third complaint concerns these body panels under the door. Uh, it's way too thick. When you step out, your pants rubs on the outer panel. If you've got mud or dirt out there, your pants are going to get dirty. Better keep the car clean and don't wear white pants. Okay, let's talk price. Base price for the IS350 convertible is $46,790. That's competitive with the Mercedes SLK. This one had the F Sport suspension package with bigger wheels, bigger tires, sport grill, all kinds of fancy eye candy at $2550. High intensity headlamps at $8075. Headlamp washers $100. Parking assist with rear sensors $500. Navigation system with audio, $35.20. Oh, come on, $105 for a trunk mat and $64 for a cargo net. Once again, this should be standard equipment. Now, if you can't afford this price, remember the Lexus IS 250 with a smaller engine starts around $42,000. The total tab for this is $55,399. If this convertible is too expensive for you, we have two more coming up. The Mini Cooper John Cooper Works convertible in the high 30s and the Volkswagen Beetle convertible for far less. Stay tuned. The Lexus IS 350 has a 3.5 liter V6 putting out 306 horsepower and hooked to a 6 speed automatic. If this is too much for you there's a smaller 2.5 liter V6 putting out 204 horsepower but of course this bigger V6 is more fun. Now many of the automotive riders have been telling you that the ride quality of the Lexus IS 350 convertible is very smooth and soft, and they're lying to you. When you set the tires at factory specs of 35 PSI front and 38 PSI rear, this is a very firm riding car. Great for the racetrack and corner ability, but not smooth at all. However, you can solve this by lowering the tire pressures below factory specs around 30 front and 33 rear, you get a much, much smoother ride and won't affect handling that much in daily driving. So if you have one of these, that's a tip from me to you. Running of power. The Lexus IS convertible is an excellent machine. Got a very nice, powerful engine. Excellent handling. 
great steering and brake performance. A nice ride if you follow my tire pressure instructions that I mentioned earlier. And the quality, typical Lexus, very outstanding. So the minor complaints about the sun visors and the cramped interior we can overlook. And if you can afford the price tag, this is a very, very nice rig. Now if this car doesn't fit your budget, we have two other convertibles we're going to show you. The John Cooper Works Mini Cooper Convertible and the Volkswagen Beetle Convertible. Coming right up. This is the 2013 Volkswagen Beetle. In this case, the Beetle Convertible. This is a pretty nice looking car in my case though, probably more because of the beautiful gold metallic paint. For those of you who think we're missing an engine back here, Volkswagen doesn't put the engine in the rear anymore, not on the Beetle anyway. We do have a decent trunk size considering the size of the car. Since they put the engine in the front, we'll take a look at that. The base engine is a 2.5 liter, putting out 170 horsepower, rated at 22 to 30 miles per gallon. I've only driven this in the city, getting around 22. For those who want more power, there's a 200 horsepower turbo, that rated at 21 to 21 miles per gallon. There's also a turbo diesel. I've driven in other vehicles that can get up to 40 plus miles per gallon. Transmission wise, this comes with a six speed automatic. Other engines also come with a six speed manual. The interior of the Beetle is very nice. In my case, more so because I had a very nice tan colored interior. There's decent room on the rear seating unless the front seats are pushed back. Then your legs are going to get a bit squished. Coming up to the front where we drive, the gauges are large, easy to read. Controls on the steering wheel are useful to have. I like the climate control. Three simple knobs. A design that's worked for a long, long time. We don't need push-button computer stuff like on other cars. This is very simple. Temperature, fan speed, and where the vents are going to be used. Why can't all manufacturers just stick to this? Stereo system is nice. Simple to use once you learn the controls. It can be a bit of a pain if you don't. The glove box is quite large. Fit a lot of stuff in there. You also have an extra storage container up here. For those of you who work in law enforcement, it's a good place to hide your wares of the trade. Actually, I couldn't find any complaints about the cabin at all. Volkswagen did a pretty good job here. Well, the Beetle's a nice car to drive. It's not a Porsche. But the engine puts more than adequate power, and there's always the turbo if you need more. Cornery ability is very good. The engine's very smooth and quiet. Just a mild hum. The transmission always knows what gear to be in as well. It has a sport mode for more aggressive driving, which is the one I'm in now. When hitting these railroad tracks, the absorbs the bumps pretty good. Excellent brakes, absolutely perfect. This is a very nice car to drive with the turbo, it's going to be even better. All right, to get the opinion on this Volkswagen, let's go to the man on the street, someone who has some transportation here. How are you doing, sir? Hey, how are you? You like my ride? <laughs> well, it doesn't get good gas mileage as mine, I think, if it's running. No, it don't get good foot mileage either. <laughs> so tell me, if you were going to replace this car with a vehicle, what would you think about doing it with this Volkswagen? Do you think you'd have more room? Uh, probably so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
A lot more room. But maybe not in the trunk. Yeah. Well, the trunk's got good size spaces. The trunk's in the front, right? No, trunk's in the rear. They don't oh, do that anymore. They don't do it anymore? No, don't do it anymore. Huh. I don't know. I, I, don't, I haven't seen what how big the trunk is. It, uh, damn be sure enough room. There is no trunk in I don't think we could fit all of this in there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I probably wouldn't want to put that in there anyway unless I bought it in there. Mm. Bought the van. Well, if you're saving up enough cans of stuff, uh, this is only around $30,000. You think that's a good price? 30000 Yeah. Wow, I ain't paid for a car in so long. I guess it would be. Sounds like a lot for a bug, huh? Yeah, it does. Well, they start at 20,000. Does that make it sound better? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, lots of luck on your venture here. Yeah. You want a drag race? Yeah, want a drag race? Yeah. Oh, no. I bet you five bucks. <laughs> you I already gave you five bucks. Five bucks I got. Uh, <laughs> you took my last five bucks I got. You got it backwards. Yeah, but you got a nice. If I didn't have a full tank of gas, I'd be walking too. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much. All right. Thank sir. you very much. You take care. I might mention it only takes less than 10 seconds for this top to pop up. Good thing because I'm in the middle of rain out here. Volkswagen doesn't want to get their cars back soaking wet on the inside. I also mentioned on a drive the engine was very quiet but listening to the video picked up a lot of exhaust sound in the background. That's the sporty exhaust sound. Sounds more like a little Porsche. But the engine itself is very quiet normal driving. Price-wise, they start at 20000 loaded up with the diesel engines, turbo engines, leather, all that stuff. They can go up to around 33000 This in here was in between. This is a nice-looking car, very pleasant to drive. If you play the options right, you can get a very good price and a good deal. Actually, I like this vehicle. This is the 2013 Volkswagen Beetle. In this case, the Beetle Convertible. This is a pretty nice looking car, in my case though, probably more because of the beautiful gold metallic paint. For those of you who think we're missing an engine back here, Volkswagen doesn't put the engine in the rear anymore, not on the Beetle anyway. We do have a decent trunk size considering the size of the car. Since they put the engine in the front, we'll take a look at that. The base engine is a 2.5 liter, putting out 170 horsepower, rated at 22 to 30 miles per gallon. I've only driven this in the city, getting around 22. For those who want more power, there's a 200 horsepower turbo, that rated at 21 to 21 miles per gallon. There's also a turbo diesel. I've driven in other vehicles that can get up to 40 plus miles per gallon. Transmission wise, this comes with a six speed automatic. Other engines also come with a six speed manual. The interior of the Beetle is very nice, in my case, more so because I had a very nice tan colored interior. There's decent room on the rear seating, unless the front seats are pushed back. Then your legs are going to get a bit squished. Coming up to the front where we drive, the gauges are large, easy to read. Controls on the steering wheel are useful to have. I like the climate control. Three simple knobs, a design that's worked for a long, long time. We don't need push button computer stuff like on other cars. This is very simple. Temperature, fan speed, and where the vents are going to be used. Why can't all manufacturers just stick to this? Stereo systems nice, simple to use once you learn the controls. It can be a bit of a pain if you don't. The glove box is quite large, fit a lot of stuff in there. You also have an extra storage container up here. For those of you who work in law enforcement, it's a good place to hide your wares of the trade. Actually, I couldn't find any complaints about the cabin at all. Volkswagen did a pretty good job here. Well, the Beetle's a nice car to drive. It's not a Porsche, but the engine puts more than adequate power, and there's always the turbo if you need more. Cornering a bit of 
visibility is very good. The engine's very smooth and quiet. Just a mild hum. The transmission always knows what gear to be in as well. It has a sport mode for more aggressive driving, which is what I'm in now. When hitting these railroad tracks, the absorbs the bumps pretty good. Excellent brakes, absolutely perfect. This is a very nice car to drive with the turbo, it's going to be even better. All right, to get the opinion on this Volkswagen, let's go to the man on the street, someone who has some transportation here. How are you doing, sir? Hey, how are you? You like my ride? <laughs> well, it doesn't get good gas mileage as mine, I think, if it's running. No, it don't get good foot mileage either. <laughs> so tell me, if you were going to replace this car with a vehicle, what would you think about doing it with this Volkswagen? Do you think you'd have more room? Uh, probably so, yeah. A lot more room. But maybe not in the trunk? Yeah. Well, the trunk's got good size spaces. The trunk's in the front, right? No, trunk's in the rear. They don't oh, do that anymore. They don't do it anymore? No, don't do it anymore. Huh. I don't know. I, I, don't, I haven't seen what how big the trunk is. But... Uh, damn be sure enough room. There is no trunk in I don't think we could fit all of this in there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I probably wouldn't want to put that in there anyway unless I bought it. In, mm. Bought the van. Well, well you're saving up enough cans of stuff. Uh, this is only around $30,000. You think that's a good price? 30000 Yeah. Wow, I ain't paid for a car in so long. I guess it would be. Sounds like a lot for a bug, huh? Yeah, it does. Well, they start at 20,000. Does that make it sound better? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, lots of luck on your venture here. Yeah. You want a drag race? Uh, want a drag race? Yeah. Oh, no. I bet you five bucks. <laughs> you I already gave you five bucks. Five bucks I got. Uh, <laughs> you took my last five bucks I got. You got it backwards. <laughs> yeah, but you got a nice. If I didn't have a full tank of gas, I'd be walking too. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much. All right. Thank sir. you very much. You take care. I might mention it only takes less than 10 seconds for this top to pop up. Good thing because I'm in the middle of rain out here. Volkswagen doesn't want to get their cars back soaking wet on the inside. I also mentioned on a drive the engine was very quiet but listening to the video picked up a lot of exhaust sound in the background. That's the sporty exhaust sound. Sounds more like a little Porsche. But the engine itself is very quiet normal driving. Price-wise, they start at 20000 loaded up with the diesel engines, turbo engines, leather, all that stuff. They can go up to around 33000 This in here was in between. This is a nice-looking car, very pleasant to drive. If you play the options right, you can get a very good price and a good deal. Actually, I like this vehicle. This is the 2013 Mini Cooper with the John Cooper package. It also has the convertible roof. It also includes monster sized Brembo disc brakes, the size of a Domino's pizza. There is a sportier exhaust in there somewhere. Now, these are not cheap. The convertible version runs around $35,000. This one was loaded up with more options. So hit $39,845. Now most of the John Cooper cars sold have six-speed manual transmissions. Now I've used these. It's a great gearbox, fun to use. And many owners of the John Cooper cars would balk at the idea of having an automatic transmission, like I got. But you ought to hold off your judgment if you're one of those, because actually there are some advantages here. Number one, the automatic also has six speeds. There is a computer operated sport mode that does some very aggressive shifting, jerks you forward and back in your seat. Number three, we get a very nice set of paddle shifters for taking high speed corners without taking your hand off the wheel when you're shifting. And number four, this turbo engine has lots of torque at low speeds, which is suitable for an automatic. 
I have not done any stopwatch times yet, but in everyday driving for the past couple days, I've noticed that the performance of this gearbox to this engine is very close to the six-speed manual. In fact, once you get moving, like passing power on the freeway, I'm getting to understand it's a bit faster. But we'll find out when we take this on the back roads in a couple days. Now before we get started, I just had a few minor gripes to get out of the way. Number one, this is a BMW product. So many does have this BMW infatuation with using run flat tires on their cars. The advantage of these is if you get a flat, you can run about 40-50 miles to the nearest repair station. The disadvantage is the ride quality of these tires just suck. Very, very stiff riding, very noisy. Don't like it. Furthermore, if you're on the interstate, you get a flat, and the nearest town is over 50 miles away, you're kind of screwed because, as you see in the back, there is no spare tire issued, no jack, no nothing. Except in my case, my little box with my air pump and fixed flat, which you will very seriously need if you get a flat on the freeway. This is why I do not like run flat tires. Plus the replacement cost, which is twice what a conventional tire costs. But that's just the way they come, so you have to live with it. My second beef, which pertains to this car only, is the black interior. I cannot understand, for the life of me, why anybody would want a vehicle with a convertible top and black interior. The sun bakes these seats like a frying pan, and it roasts your butt like a frying pan. It's a bad, bad idea, unless you live in Alaska. Fortunately, Mini does have other colors. Light tan works quite well. Black forget it. But this is correctable by ordering a different color. And my third complaint, which pertains to this vehicle only, is how a vehicle can be $39,845 and not have satellite radio, something we get on the cheapest of Korean cars nowadays. Of course, you can order it if you choose to do so, but the fact this left the factory without such an option uh, kind of boggles me. Come on, dude. AM, FM, and this price range just don't cut it. But once again, this is correctable by ordering satellite radio. Okay, that's enough of the gripes. We'll get on with the test now. The standard mini engine is 821 horsepower and, and it starts at $20,000. There's also a factory turbo at 181 horsepower. The John Cooper Works is listed at 208 horsepower or 211 depending on what magazine you're reading. The gas mileage of this Mini Cooper is rated at 26 miles per gallon in the city and 34 on the highway. I've been doing quite a bit of driving and 25.5 in heavy city driving is what I'm getting and at 75 mile per hour cruising the best I'm seeing is 33.5, which is pretty good considering the power we're getting. I've also noticed on the freeway there's a bit of wind noise around the roof, but this is a high-strung sports car, so I guess we can overlook that. Taking the Mini on these back twisty roads, I do have some observations. Observation number one, the headlights on this vehicle work very well, whether on high beam or low beam. None of that sharp cutoff nonsense we have in other sports cars. Very well appreciated on this road where there's lots of wildlife standing on the pavement at night, which I would not care to hit. Observation number two, the ride on this car is stiffer than an ox cart and taking high speed corners while you're hitting a pothole can actually cause the tire to leave the pavement. Fortunately, stability control and traction control keep the car from leaving the pavement. So a tip for me, if you're driving fast on curved roads like this that are rough, do not turn off the traction stability control. It's a real lifesaver. 
observation number three, the steering, handling, and braking ability of this vehicle is right up there with the exotic imported sports cars. This is the real thing, folks, not an imitation. But then that's what you're paying for, right? Engine power is nice, too. Now, we've got some more observations about driving on these back twisty roads, but instead of doing it while driving, I decided to pull over because, frankly, this pavement is too rough. The suspension is too stiff, the camera is jumping all over the place, and all we're seeing on the screen is a big fat blur. So we'll continue sitting here. Now if we're talking about 0 to 60 mile per hour times, the 6 speed manual transmission car, which I drove before this, has an ever slight edge. That's because you can dump the clutch around two to 3,000 RPM get a smoking start and reach 60 in about six seconds flat. On the automatic you don't have the luxury of going out of the slot smoking tires and all that stuff. You're basically going from a dead stop. But in the end there wasn't that much difference about two tenths of a second more at the most and once the car reaches about five miles per hour beyond that the automatic is quicker but this isn't a drag racer, it's a sports car, so how it drives on a road like this is what counts. And on a road like this, the automatic transmission with the paddle shifters, it's just a better setup. It's far quicker than shifting manually with the six-speed manual transmission. You take corners, you shift, you never have to take your hand off the steering wheel. Furthermore, if you leave it in drive, and the sport mode, which is very aggressive, very very aggressive very strong downshifting and upshifting it's actually faster than the paddle shifters so all you guys that have the six-speed manual cars they're fun to drive and they're quick but on this type of driving uh, sorry guys this vehicle setup is just a little bit faster than you I think it's a very good setup and I would consider getting it if it was my car Pardon the bad quality of this next scene, but I gotta take one last run through the bridge with the top down. Woo, that was a bump. So the question we have to ask ourselves is this Mini Cooper with the John Cooper Works package and soft top worth $40,000? Well, yes and no. Obviously the factory cars with the standard turbo engines are a little more practical and certainly a lot cheaper. But if you love British sports cars with open tops and you want the maximum performance or the best Mini you can get, you certainly get a lot of bang for the buck here. And I don't think any other competitors offer more for less. So if you can afford it, go for it. If not, pick a smaller factory model and go with that perhaps. But the bottom line is I'm really going to miss this car. It was great fun to drive. This is the 2013 Mini Cooper with the John Cooper package. It also has the convertible roof. It also includes monster-sized Brembo disc brakes, the size of a Domino's pizza. There is a sportier exhaust in there somewhere. Now these are not cheap. The convertible version runs around $35,000. This one was loaded up with more options, so hit $39,845. Now most of the John Cooper cars sold have six-speed manual transmissions and I've used these. It's a great gearbox, fun to use, and many owners of the John Cooper cars would balk at the idea of having an automatic transmission like I got. But you ought to hold off your judgment if you're one of those because actually 
there are some advantages here. Number one, the automatic also has six speeds. There is a computer operated sport mode that does some very aggressive shifting, jerks you forward and back in your seat. Number three, we get a very nice set of paddle shifters for taking high speed corners without taking your hand off the wheel when you're shifting. And number four, this turbo engine has lots of torque at low speeds, which is suitable for an automatic. I have not done any stopwatch times yet but in everyday driving for the past couple days I've noticed that the performance of the gearbox to this engine is very close to the six-speed manual in fact once you get moving like passing power on the freeway I'm getting to understand it's a bit faster but we'll find out when we take this on the back roads in a couple days now before we get started, I just had a few minor gripes to get out of the way. Number one, this is a BMW product, so many does have this BMW infatuation with using run-flat tires on their cars. The advantage of these is if you get a flat, you can run about 40-50 miles to the nearest repair station. The disadvantage is the ride quality of these tires just suck. Very, very stiff riding, very noisy. Don't like it. Furthermore, if you're on the interstate, you get a flat, and the nearest town is over 50 miles away, you're kind of screwed because, as you see in the back, there is no spare tire issued, no jack, no nothing. Except in my case, my little box with my air pump and fixed flat, which you will very seriously need if you get a flat on the freeway. This is why I do not like run flat tires, plus the replacement cost, which is twice what a conventional tire costs. But that's just the way they come, so you have to live with it. My second beef, which pertains to this car only, is the black interior. I cannot understand, for the life of me, why anybody would want a vehicle with a convertible top and black interior. The sun bakes these seats like a frying pan, and it roasts your butt like a frying pan. It's a bad, bad idea, unless you live in Alaska. Fortunately, many does have other colors. Light tan works quite well. Black forget it. But this is correctable by ordering a different color. And my third complaint which pertains to this vehicle only is how a vehicle can be $39,845 and not have satellite radio. Something we get on the cheapest of Korean cars nowadays. Of course you can order it if you choose to do so but the fact this left the factory without such an option uh, kind of boggles me. Come on, dude. AM, FM, and this price range just don't cut it. But once again, this is correctable by ordering satellite radio. Okay, that's enough of the gripes. We'll get on with the test now. The standard mini engine is 121 horsepower and it starts at $20,000. There's also a factory turbo at 181 horsepower. The John Cooper Works is listed at 208 horsepower or 211 depending on what magazine you're reading. The gas mileage of this Mini Cooper is rated at 26 miles per gallon in the city and 34 on the highway. I've been doing quite a bit of driving and 25.5 in heavy city driving is what I'm getting and at 75 mile per hour cruising best I'm seeing is 33.5 which is pretty good considering the power we're getting I've also noticed on the freeway there's a bit of wind noise around the roof but this is a high-strung sports car so I guess we can overlook that Taking the Mini on these back twisty roads, I do have some observations. Observation number one, the headlights on this vehicle work very well, whether on high beam or low beam. None of that sharp cutoff nonsense we got in other sports cars. Very well appreciated on this road where there's lots of wildlife standing on the pavement at night, which I would not care to hit. 
Observation number two, the ride on this car is stiffer than an ox cart and taking high speed corners while you're hitting a pothole can actually cause the tire to leave the pavement. Fortunately, stability control and traction control keep the car from leaving the pavement. So a tip for me, if you're driving fast on curved roads like this that are rough, do not turn off the traction stability control. It's a real lifesaver. Observation number three, the steering, handling, and braking ability of this vehicle is right up there with the exotic imported sports cars. This is the real thing, folks, not an imitation. But then that's what you're paying for, right? Engine power is nice, too. Now, I've got some more observations about driving on these back twisty roads, but instead of doing it while driving, I decided to pull over because, frankly, this pavement is too rough. The suspension is too stiff, the camera is jumping all over the place, and all we're seeing on the screen is a big fat blur. So we'll continue sitting here. Now if we're talking about 0 to 60 mile per hour times, the 6 speed manual transmission car, which I drove before this, has an ever slight edge. That's because you can dump the clutch around two to 3,000 RPM get a smoking start and reach 60 in about six seconds flat. On the automatic you don't have the luxury of going out of the slot smoking tires and all that stuff. You're basically going from a dead stop. But in the end there wasn't that much difference about two tenths of a second more at the most and once the car reaches about five miles per hour beyond that the automatic is quicker. But this isn't a drag racer, it's a sports car, so how it drives on a road like this is what counts. And on a road like this, the automatic transmission with the paddle shifters is just a better setup. It's far quicker than shifting manually with the six-speed manual transmission. You take corners, you shift, you never have to take your hand off the steering wheel. Furthermore, if you leave it in drive, and the sport mode, which is very aggressive, very very aggressive very strong downshifting and upshifting it's actually faster than the paddle shifters so all you guys that have the six-speed manual cars they're fun to drive and they're quick but on this type of driving uh, sorry guys this vehicle setup is just a little bit faster than you I think it's a very good setup and I would consider getting it if it was my car Pardon the bad quality of this next scene, but I gotta take one last run through the bridge with the top down. Woo, that was a bump. So the question we have to ask ourselves is this Mini Cooper with the John Cooper Works package and soft top worth $40,000? Well, yes and no. Obviously the factory cars with the standard turbo engines are a little more practical and certainly a lot cheaper. But if you love British sports cars with open tops and you want the maximum performance or the best Mini you can get, you certainly get a lot of bang for the buck here. And I don't think any other competitors offer more for less. So if you can afford it, go for it. If not, pick a smaller factory model and go with that perhaps. But the bottom line is I'm really going to miss this car. It was great fun to drive. 